uh, wanted to welcome welcome everybody to tonight's uh, CSI session uh, on uh, facts and friction, straight talk about when projects go sideways. So we'll have a, a good panel discussion tonight on this. Uh, did want to acknowledge that the, you know we have the food tonight here. I'm glad everybody was here and able to partake. Uh, the chapter sponsored the food tonight, so thank you, chapter. Uh, I, at this point, I want to introduce uh, Michael Bird, Fort Dan Architecture, who is uh, our moderator. So, fair description. So I'm responsible for the entire night, whether it goes right or wrong. Oh, okay. So, that's Michael Bird, Fort Dan Architecture. Send all uh, <laughs> comments to him. So, uh, thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, this, this is a uh, a program I've had in mind for quite a while, uh, which is reflective of my discomfort with the items that I want to discuss. Um, so this is this is my way of actually actually you know, assuaging my own fears and doubts uh, by by summoning some people who actually make a living out of doing the things that I don't like to talk about or think about. Um, we my my goal here is is to. Is to, is to expose some of us who have heard a lot about the way the process uh, of resolving disputes uh, in the construction industry on projects is supposed to go. We've heard a lot about the way the process is supposed to work, and only communicate better to avoid bad outcomes, and if we check all boxes on our submittals, and write our specs in a certain way, and make sure the drawings get coordinated, and all that stuff. Then everything will be fine. Uh, but everything isn't always fine. And sometimes things go wrong anyway. And I think, you know, we don't, I don't personally, I have not personally in my career learned very much about how that process actually works. And, and I've, I've seen it happen once, uh, we've gone through a claims, a claims process um, and learned a lot about that I didn't know. And was left with a lot more questions than I started with. So I, I reached out to, to these three fine people and uh, I stunned that they all said yes. So uh, I'm extremely grateful that you guys are participating here and indulging. Um, our panelists, esteemed panelists. Um, Marvin, I met, um, Marvin Johnson, I met as part of BJC's Capacity Build the Warehouse program program for smaller firms in St. Louis uh, to, to learn how to do work for BJC. Uh, I've been in the program for years. One of the first things we did uh, when we started the firm and uh, when, when we got our, our certification rather and Marvin uh, Pippen and our candidate. Marvin has had a 36-year career uh, so far, including time at, at Kwame Building Group, Hunt Construction Group, BJC, um, and is now uh, bringing all that expertise as senior member of construction management partners. I believe he wrote down the first. He has uh, used all that senior level management operations, construction audit expertise, uh, contributed to the placement of over $5 billion in construction in the St. Louis metropolitan area surrounding regional markets. His consulting firm specializes in project management, construction, audit, and advisory, and diversity program management services. Uh, so I'm relying heavily on your teaching skills to, uh, to teach me some of the things that I don't know about your side of things. Because your side of things is where I am weakest, uh, for sure. Beth Dunphy was referred to me by one of our favorite commercial contractors. Uh, she is a former vice president and claims associate at Crane Agency, where she gained knowledge of coverages and strategies to protect her clients through the underwriting and claims process. And now a unit manager and account executive at Marshall Planet, which I think absorbed JW Terrell. Or... Okay. Terrell has a long history in St. Louis. Uh, she handles a book of business comprised of 50% of construction clients. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you'll help, help us understand. I know how some of the insurance products work from a designer standpoint. I, I don't understand at all how some of those products work from a contractor and owner standpoint. 
And lastly, uh, Tom Avery. Uh, Tom Avery is a shareholder at Cape Sokol, specializing in commercial litigation. For over 20 years, Tom's represented and advised contractors, design builders, design professionals, and owners involved in construction defect disputes. He's built a reputation for working to prevent litigation when given the opportunity, but when necessary, has extensive experience in trying and arbitrating numerous defect claims. Uh, full disclosure, Tom supports in architecture's uh, attorney. Uh, luckily, we haven't had very much occasion to... I was going to say, full disclosure, you guys don't give me any business. <laughs> Hopefully, we can continue to stay off your agenda, uh, but hopefully you'll also share some cautionary tales with us tonight. Uh, so thank you again for being I mentioned a little bit about our claims experience. The process was surprising to me uh, in a number of ways. Um, things did not go the way I thought they were going to go because I thought we had done everything the way we were supposed to do it, to stay out of, of some of these, these circumstances that we ended up in. Uh, if we're talking, as we're talking tonight about hypotheticals, um, just as just to kind of kind of simplify the conversation, I'd like to kind of have some some a framework of some basic assumptions so we can kind of skip some of the things we already know. Uh, so I'm going to assume that we are we're talking about circumstances where where all the parties are using agreements that use fairly standard language, the AIA agreements or EJCC agreements or consensus docs, something with a, a history of you know. A, in the marketplace that people understand. Uh, and that we've modified the documents in certain ways that I think, I believe, are pretty traditional in the insurance industry. Uh, extra terms and conditions that may not be in the templates limiting liability or trying to, uh, limiting exposure to consequential damages, uh, limiting things like indemnity uh, that, that are not really addressed in some of the templates that I, I know particularly the AIA templates don't address very well. Um, and there were that everybody is is assured to some degree, uh, which I think is generally the case, but I'm sure there are some exceptions to this. So we'll hopefully get into some of that. So um, my first question is is really about you know the beginning of the process. Uh, but when something starts to look bad, uh, the way that our broker talks to me about it is, is they want to know about a circumstance. And Tom, I talked to Tom earlier today. That's not a term Tom's familiar with, but I think it's a term Beth is probably familiar with. Yeah. And, and something is, a, is maybe going to go wrong. And, uh, and we have to make a call to our, to our broker and say, there's something that's, that's sketchy. We are obligated. Here to let you know that there's something that, that you need to keep an eye on. Um, when that transitions and becomes a dispute, uh, is a little unclear to me. Uh, and then when that dispute becomes an actual capital C claim, is also a little unclear. So maybe Beth, you can start and kind of address some of this. How, what's the difference between these things in the process? Will do. So uh, I was just going to give credit where credit is due when your broker asks you if there's a circumstance or if something has developed to call your insurance agents. I do have insurance that do not call me and say, well, we've been discussing this claim for the past 30 days and I'm the last person to find out. So uh, credit where credit is due there. But when an insurer does call me and say, we've got a situation where that situation is, um, and I'm going to be upfront honest, 99% uh, of the claims that I do see with regards to uh, builder's risk or a project of some sort is going to be water damage, theft, or wind and hail here in the Midwest, right? So when it comes to the water damage claim, um, I always discuss or have the insured explain to me in full detail what has happened. Who has notified you? What is going on? What was the project that was uh, being worked on? And uh, whether my insured is the general contractor or the subcontractor, that also uh, is important information to understand and have at that time. So uh, with that being said, I know that you have different definitions when it comes to with Missouri state law. To be up front, every state 
guidelines and laws are different when it comes to requirements uh, via the insurance policies, the forms, laws with regards to notifying. Yeah, and 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 you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of different legal issues with respect to when you have to give notice to your insurance company, and if you fail to do that, what are the implications for that? So, for example, uh, Missouri generally follows a, a a legal standard that says your insurer can only deny coverage if there is a prejudice to them by the lateness of your disclosure. More or less, they can't just say, hey, you were supposed to do it in 30 days, and on the 31st day, no coverage. They're going to have to show that your failure to disclose it to them in a timely manner prejudiced them in some way. They, they weren't able to preserve evidence. They weren't able to do something like that. Now, on the flip side, the last time I looked at Illinois law, it's a reasonableness standard. It's not a, it's not a prejudice standard. It's did you provide notice to the insurance company within a reasonable period of time under the circumstances? But I will tell you that um, in the happy occurrence, when, when my clients call me early in the process, which I want to say, emphasize over and over again, is call me or call your lawyer early in the process. There are things we can do to help to make it better. I know you don't believe that when I say it, okay? <laughs> but it really, really is true. Uh, I have clients who I've worked with for 20 plus years, and the goal is not to get them into an arbitration or get them into litigation. The goal is to help them avoid that. And we can do things to help that early in the process. So, uh, and one of the things I almost always say is notify your insurer uh, because you are taking a big risk if you don't notify your insurer that you're going to lose your coverage. Uh, and so that is the first thing I would say is if you think there's a circumstance or an occurrence or a potential claim, pick up the phone, call Beth, and, and tell them that that's out there. Then we can talk more about other things we do to protect ourselves in the interim. I don't know if you want me to address like the difference between a claim and a dispute. Or... I, uh, I'm going to, well, I definitely want to get there, but I'm going to put it in okay. there for just a second because uh, Marvin is going to tell me what contractors carry insurance, right? What does that insurance cover? For me, it covers errors and omissions, right? Professional liability. Plus, there's there's commercial general liability. And, you know, contractors carry uh, GL and workers comp, and, and and in some cases, they they will provide the, the business risk depending on what the situation is on that particular project. If you don't want to contractor carry that. My my program is one of Tom mentioned the word avoidance, and our program is strictly geared for uh, avoidance. If, if I can prevent them from having to make the phone call uh, to Beth, um, or maybe even the early phone call to Tom outside of um, the the consummation of the of the agreement during the time that the budget is like that are being established. You know, that's, you know, most of what I see on the owner's website, not necessarily, you know, a water damage or hail damage, though that happens and you have certain weather events and how is all that documented, but it's usually compliance, performance, those types of, of, of things. And, and we like to say we can avoid some of that if, if our, if our, if our language and, and our scope and in our agreement is clear and unambiguous. And, and though there's no 100%, you know, clean contract where there, there won't ever be a, but if you, if you start there, you know, my, my experience is, 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 is said that, you know, in order to avoid a misunderstanding, always get an understanding. And as I start to peel back onions, when I think of the dispute, and this is far before the claim occurs, just when it starts to look and feel like a dispute, when you start to peel that onion back, what are we disputing about? Usually, that lack of understanding rears its head. You know, so, but by the time it gets to, to where they have to call Tom, or even call Beth, you know, other than they should call them on the front end to make sure that, that they are reviewing the language and, and looking at the risk there. You know what I'm saying? And to feed off of that, 
uh, your policies are your professional liability policy and your general liability policy are two different types of policy. One is a claims made, and one is an occurrence. I won't go into I'm here, so I will not go into the, the definitions between the two. But as Tom mentioned, you by withholding the information that there's a potential claim that you have been made aware of. You are jeopardizing the coverage on your policies by doing that, by not allowing the carrier to the ability to investigate and to begin the process with your policies that you are purchasing, unless you're changing the wording. And again, everybody's policy is not the same. You have endorsements, you can take off coverages, you can have hard facts. But majority of policies are a duty to defend. You are giving that carrier premium so that in the event of a loss, their duty is to defend you. And by withholding them, withholding information from them, or that you've been made aware of a claim, you're not allowing that to happen. And with that, they can come back and say, well, because you didn't follow the terms of the policy, neither did we. So we don't have to now protect you. We don't have to defend you. That obligation on our part to notify our insurer right. is not, not a matter of law. It's not a contract with us. And the right. Which then is, is then modified by the law. Uh, so, for example, the, your insurance contract in Missouri could say, you must give us notice of occurrence within seven days. And Missouri law would say, no, that is only going to be enforced if the failure to give notice causes prejudice to the insurer. So, what I, so it's not clear. Okay. I do want to say one thing on what Marvin said. Uh, a lot of the disputes that I've dealt with over the years in construction contracts are where the parties have gone in and modified on the front end a portion of the contract and they don't fully understand that if they're going to modify this portion of like the AIA A201, there's three other places you also need to change. And so they modify, you know, they sit there and they either get a, a pen or something and they make the change in this one place. They don't make the change in the other two places. Then when I get involved and there's a dispute, one side point at that point, this one and the other one say no, it says this over here. And then you've got him ambiguity in your language, and you've got a problem. Yep. Which is why they do need you to talk to you on the front. Mm -hmm. Very front. Sort of like right. drawing, right? You take a change to, to this sheet on the architectural. What What's the residual impact on the other sheets that are different? So if we have to say to the owners or to the CM for that matter, if you want to modify it, make sure that your legal counsel is right. Yeah. 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 My understanding. At this point, so now I think we know a little bit more about the pieces here. Uh, the difference between a, a circumstance or a dispute and a claim, as I've it's been kind of hinted to me, but never told to me explicitly, is when it becomes a demand for money or some other kind of service to address it. So the, the I, there's I'm right about a little bit of apples and oranges going yeah. on. All right, so. AIA form contract, the A201, and other different versions define a claim. So a claim is um, where there's a written notice of a demand for payment of money or change in contract time or something like that. So if, if the uh, if the contractor thinks they're entitled to additional time under the contract and the owner's not agreeing to the change order, that can result in a claim. Or if you if if there's a you know, a, a change directive that's been made by the owner, and you think that entitles you to a, an additional amount of money on the contract you can't agree, that could be a claim. What Beth is talking about is your insurance your insurance policy defines an occurrence. If there's an occurrence, that triggers possibly the insurance company's obligation to defend and indemnify. If you think there is a possibility that if you have an occurrence, you want to make a claim a different kind of claim under your insurance policy and make them aware of that potential occurrence. And we, the insured, make the claim to our insurer. Correct. Right. You put them on notice. Right. So that's another thing that, you know, insureds get nervous, right? So, well, I mean, I was joking around with everybody. I said, when insureds call me and say, Beth, I have a hypothetical situation. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Something happened. Right. Just tell me what happened. Let's talk it through and walk it through. We are never, as your brokers, we have the right to protect you and your insurance policies and trust us. We don't want to have 
you know, 10 open claims on your policy and then go into a renewal and have to explain what is going to happen if it doesn't look good on you. And we don't want to have to do that. But by putting your carrier on notice, yes, it will show up on your loss runs, but it will show up at zero. The carriers, the underwriters will appreciate that more because you're open to communicate. You're not going to sit back and hide that things are happening on the background. Underwriters, if your producer's explaining that to them, saying, hey, yes, this was the situation, but they had nothing to do with it. I've seen, and I'm sure you have, I've seen subpoenas of four pages long. If my insurer changed a light bulb on a, a situation where there was a defect, then, they, then we had to make a claim. We submitted that, we put them on notice, but if their attorney was able to get them out of it, and then explaining that to the underwriter. So don't be scared, is what I'm trying to say. Don't be scared to go and talk to your producer and say, I have a question. I have a potential situation. Let's talk it through and walk it through. Do I need to put the carrier on notice? It, it, I'm going to jump to the next question in a second. But it has, our broker is pretty adamant but never talks about really why that these sorts of things, that that, that initial question call be a call. Not an email. You need to have that conversation by phone, not an email, so that presumably, because this is this is something it, it is the correspondence between me and my broker will make sure there's no that's not privileged information, right? Actually, it is. It's, yeah, you're you're it, except for in a dispute between you and your broker or your insurer. Uh, Missouri law. Um, makes privilege those communications with your insurer. So therefore, and that's very important because we want to encourage you to be open and honest okay. with your insurer, as like with your lawyer. Um, and, and so those are covered by the privilege. And that's also going to, it, when we get into it later, um, it also gives good opportunities to help protect you when you're trying to figure out whether or not if, if an owner or somebody's making it, asserting a claim against you and threatening litigation or arbitration, there are things we can do to use the privilege or what's called the work product doctrine to investigate that claim uh, in a way where the results of that investigation are also covered by the privilege. Okay. That's a very important bit of advice you get on the front end to help you get through the process. Okay. All right. So moving on a little bit, all this will feed into this, this next kind of set of questions here. But the, there are enough, in my mind, there are a number of ways that construction defects can kind of go. One I have some familiarity with is where something something isn't quite right, it's not working quite right in the finished product on the job. Right? Something is leaking that shouldn't be leaking, something is cracking that shouldn't be cracking. And the parties do not agree on the reason why and on who is responsible. Um, what what's What's the chain of events there? I, I have notified my insurer. Presumably the contractor has notified their insurer. Is the owner, this is a question from Marvin, I suppose, is, is in that circumstance, if there's something wrong on, on the construction side, the project isn't complete yet, or is, do they have an insurer that's involved at that point? Or are they letting us, are we supposed to solve it ourselves as they are? Right, owners like to solve. They like to believe they can solve it. And so uh, usually the first thing they start doing is point fingers, right? Like that's Joe and Holiday. So when they wanna they wanna really uh, push the uh, push the liability onto the contractor, uh, usually first, um, and maybe the designer second. Uh, so when if there's a if there's a perceived defect or we're not sure. Right, you know, the owner goes to the contract to, to, to see what does the contract say about you know operation, training, um, you know what I mean, warranty. They'll bring get the engineer involved if it's MEP, and then they the engineer may, may write a, a letter, uh, some sort of opinion letter, and then they, they start to go from there. But usually, I don't. I think the owner calls their okay. broker. Okay. But the contractor yeah. is the contractor I may, am. the architect may, or engineer may, but generally the owner is pushing is pushing that. You know, fix this. I'm I have retention, I have dollars remaining from your pay app, so fix it. 
Four hours. Four hours. Okay. So if, if it's clearly my fault, if I've done something, everybody knows it's my fault. Everybody knows that we missed something, something didn't get done detailed correctly, and it's on the job, and now it's, it's baked in. Um, my obligations don't seem to change in that regard. Um, is the contractor still calling? They're insured. Well, I mean, in my experience, uh, very rarely on the on the front end is it absolutely clear whether it's a design defect or right. a construction defect. So and nobody calls. So I, so and and a lot of my work has been uh, representing a design builder. Okay, so you know you package I didn't think of that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So you package the design and the construction there. But but my advice is if 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 there is, let's say, let's say a window is leaked, okay, it might be an issue with the design. It might be an issue with the construction. I would tell everybody to put their insurers on notice and and work the problem. Yep, I agree. Yeah. And if it's clearly the contract is fault, yeah. understand that it's not clear to you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to put my guy on notice also. I would because if I'm the con if I'm representing the contractor, I'm going to look to try to argue that there's an issue with the design. I couldn't build what you drew, okay? Um, you know, and, and so not only that, I will tell you also in in a design build context, and, and Beth, you can address this as the attorney for the design builder. I want it to be a design defect because the coverage for design is way better than the coverage for construction defects. So I want to be, sorry, but I want to be <laughs> towards, you know, towards the architect and the designers because the, the coverage is just much better uh, when it comes to a defect. In, in a design build scenario? Or, if the, if, or even if it's not design build, if I'm the contractor and the owner has engaged the, the architect directly, I want to figure out some way that the architect has to be stuck. Design build covers covers some basic things where the contractor hires engineer and architect, um, but the contractors hire lots of designers just through the normal course. Does their insurance cover the design portion of uh, some some degree of the design portion of their sub consultants? Do they have some kind of you know? Uh, I mean, in the situation I've seen. That I've seen where the, the the builder, the design builder, is going to have its own CGL, and 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 then they're going to engage an architect, which might be in a house or it might be someone, and then that one's going to have separate coverage. You know, if they're like a captured design firm, they might be under the same insurer, but it's going to be a separate policy for the you know, typically. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and I would go back to that and state that. If the owner procures and gets a general contractor, who the general contractor has then gone out and either had their in house design um, architect do the work or went to an outside firm, in my line of business, in my world, the first thing people are going to say, I want to see the contract. Who is responsible? Did, as my GC, did he go out and make sure that the architect or the firm had proper insurance? So they have, you know. If not, then I know that my general contractor's insurance, their professional professional you know insurance policy will cover that contract, even though I or cover that firm, even though I make sure because we're risk managers, right? I like to push risk anytime I can off of my insurance. If somebody else is doing a job and they're negligent, I want to make sure their policy is on call and not yours. Their well, typically is some coverage on the design builder side that covers the design. Portion. Correct. But yes, they are they are requiring their sub design sub consultants to have their own. Account. They better be. <laughs> they better make sure that you guys have your own insurance. And the good, the good, the good, yes. Good all right. Yes, but it all I will say the first thing, let me see that contract. I want to see if you sign a contract saying that you're assuming all of their liabilities because they don't have it and you made a business decision to look, to accept them because that's your cousin or whatever the case may be, I need to see the contract. Um, 
So if there's a defect and it's a design build project, when does that insure? When do those insurers get notified? Because in my experience, design builder part of the, the, the attractiveness of the design build process for the contractor is that their designer is working directly for them and is compelled to be a part of that solution. Yes. But without bringing it to the owner's level. Correct. But then you're always then going to have multiple levels. So let's say the, des the design builder receives a claim from the owner. Okay. Even if the if the architecture firm, the designer, is a captured firm under the design firm, uh, most likely that architecture firm is going to engage engineering firms, which may not be part of the same company. They may have delegated portions of the MVP design to someone else. And so when, if I'm representing the design builder, the second I get a claim, I'm figuring out who downstream I need to send a notice of the claim to them, basically saying the owner says we owe X. If we owe X to the owner, you owe it to us. And put your insurers on notice. And it could be more than one insurer. So we're talking about two different policies, right? Your errors and emissions policy and your general liability are generally the two that if there's a claim, whether it be a defect and at the time, like you said, after investigation, we don't know what it is up front, unless it's very obvious when you know. You know, or a water damage because somebody forgot to train the pipe, right? But regardless, you have two different types of policies. You've got your professional errors and emissions policy, and you've got your general liability. Your ENL policy pays for financial loss. Your general liability pays for any bodily injury or property damage. So if you if there's a loss and it's caused property damage. But is leading to the fact that now the project has been delayed because now you got to go back and fix it. You need to put your ENO carrier on notice because there could now be a financial loss. There needs to be more permits obtained. Uh, the operations are supposed they to both, start, and they both get it. They, you need to notify at least four. Yeah, depending on the claim, obviously. But for the most part, every time that I've had a claim, it's always had two carriers involved. Now, like from the owner's standpoint. You know, the owner likes to sit back and, and watch the contractor have a conversation with their uh, in, in, in insurance company, likewise with the architect and engineer. Because the owner is saying, you owe me a building free from defects, you know, of any kind, too cold. Yeah. Right? So the owner's generally not going to call there because they're sitting here. You, when the building's right, I'll accept the building. The other, uh, the other thing I would, uh, well, what you're saying is there may be multiple policies, but there also might be multiple insurance companies. I might have an instance where if it's an occurrence, uh, Beth talked about the difference between an occurrence policy versus a claims made policy. But if your policy is an occurrence policy, that means it's the policy for the year that the occurrence happened in. It, sometimes it's not clear when exactly the, the defect was created. So, and if you switched insurance companies, you if, you may have to put both of the companies on notice yep. to make sure that wherever it falls, you're covered. Yep. Nope. I've had a, a work colleague at another agency talk about an ENO from the producer standpoint is that they they switch their general liability from an occurrence type policy to a uh, a claims made. Claims made, the policy has to be enforced when a claim was made. It doesn't have it doesn't matter if it was 10 years ago. You have to have a policy in place when a claim has been made. And there was a gap in coverage. There was a year gap in coverage because also in policies you've got tail coverage, which you've seen in contracts, you're required to carry coverage for the statute proposed, which in Missouri is 10 years. But you can also purchase nose coverage if you do purchase a claims made policy. So again, and that covers you for any events that happened prior to purchasing that policy. Marvin, uh, <laughs> have we got that? Right. All right. Those are the tales. <laughs> Buy more insurance. Buy more insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Buy more insurance. <laughs> right. Um, so, and this is this is a question exactly about that. So, how do contractors prepare for dealing with defects? And I'm talking. Yeah, I understand that they are obligated with their owner 
just have to be a bond. Just have some failure to perform. Uh, that they have some, sure, some liability coverage uh, that may be related to professional kind of design services and certainly commercial general liability stuff on the job site. Uh, but I'm talking about contingency. Like, how do they decide about money they set aside to resolve problems? And how do they budget for similar things from their subcontractors? They, they generally do not have contingency for defects. I mean, contingencies are generally for unforeseen uh, elements of the project. Usually, variances between field conditions, what's on the drawings, or uh, sometimes issues related to the authorities having jurisdiction, which are the, the code of issues and, and things that come out of their reviews and comments and, 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 and changes and adoption of new codes. And um, generally, I haven't seen them say we're, we've established a contingency for defects. But they do make mistakes sometimes. Well, not that they're going to tell you about them. Right, <laughs> right. But, but yes, they how do they pay for the mistakes? Well, it depends on how uh, sophisticated the owner is. Because there are some construction managers, general contractors, who Make mistakes all the time, but they're savvy enough in terms of how it's communicated to the owner in terms of the reason for that, right? Uh, the, the, the subcontractor may have missed a portion of the scope, you know, or it wasn't clear on the drawings. It really may not have been clear on the drawings, right? So there, there, there are a lot of different arguments that, that can be made by the contractor in terms of, of, of dealing with. Um, you know, scope creep in, in various in various ways. So there's no one way. But but in in the case of a defect which I stay away from those arguments, um, you know, the, you know, getting getting the engineer involved, and usually there's a there's a process of of, of trying to understand the origin of it and, and whether it was yes. you know, design related. You know, when it occurred, um, that that probably happens long before the phone call is made to to, to bed, because they're trying to they're trying to work through some of the early discussions because everybody really wants to know is there a possibility that I'm going to be exposed there, you know. But but they're generally not allowed to use contingency. Uh, funds. Maybe contingency is, is too formal a word. Yeah. Is there is there any line item in your typical project budget that is held back for for, for resolving things like this? For the resolving a potential defect. Well when I when I audit on, on the front end, I look for that money. So if if I see allowances that uh, that I can type to um, the contractor's discretionary spend of those dollars or something like that, I advise the owner to take that money back. So even if the contractor, you don't want your owner to pay for it? Well, I don't want the dollars sitting in the, the contractor's budget to use only at his discretion. That's, that's, that's all right. That's, yeah. Okay. All right. If there's a defect, parties can't agree. Everybody needs, we need a third party to come in and do some testing. Uh, how, where does that fit into the process? And I, mean, I guess it depends more or less on what, how, how contentious these relationships are at this point. Um, but nobody wants to pay for that consultant to come in. Is there, how does that get resolved if nobody wants to pay for that third party to come in? I don't it know. depends. Yeah, it depends. So, you know, a lot of times it depends on the dollar figure, the potential dollar figure we're talking about. Um, but my experience has been typically if it's a large issue, um, both the owner and the contractor are going to want to get a second opinion from some type of expert to determine whether or not they did it right or did it wrong or whose part it is. And that, that gives me the opportunity to get a little free legal advice 
on how an important thing to do in that situation. Um, there is a tendency to say, hey, I've got a, I've got a design issue, or, or, or let's say I've got a concrete issue. Um, and I want to know exactly what is, you know, my concrete is buckling. And I want to know why the concrete's buckling. And you may want to go then get an expert to come in to, to advise you as a party as to what that is. Do I have a defense? Is it something beyond my control? Who's, who's issued this? One of the smartest things you can do is call your attorney early and have the attorney be the one who hires that expert to do the investigation. Okay? The reason for that is that expert's going to give you an answer. That expert is that answer is either going to support you or it's going to say you screwed up. All right. But if you run it through your attorney, the opinion of that expert is going to be protected by the what's called the work product privilege. If you don't like the answer and you end up in arbitration or litigation, that opinion from that expert never sees the light of day. Okay. If you go out as the contractor and hire that expert and get that opinion, it's discoverable. It's going to come out. And if it is inconsistent with the position you later want to take at the arbitration, let's say the expert just got it wrong. Then you're going to hear about it in cross-examination, right? Okay. So do, running it through your attorney is a way to get, for you to be able to get an honest opinion from a, a, another expert to know whether you're good or you're bad, because you want to know if you're bad. Because if, if, if I know my client's in a bad position, I want to try to settle the thing early, right? And try to get out as cheaply as possible. But, and, and I will tell you, the vast majority of my clients want to make it right. You know, they're, they're in the business for the long haul, so they want to make it right. But you don't want to run the risk that you get a bad opinion from an expert who just doesn't understand it or doesn't get it right, and then you're going to hear about that. And, you know, you're stuck with it. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit yes. because now we're talking about attorneys getting involved at this stage mm -hmm. before it is a claim. Yeah, potentially. Potentially. Um, the the insurance company <coughs> hires the attorney. Is that correct? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. How how does who decides that? If you go into a mark when you go marketing your insurance program and you tell your producer, your broker that we have assigned this general counsel. This is the firm that we use. They, they've been with us for 10 years. We want them to prove that needs to be discussed at the beginning of your process before you buy the policy because afterwards the carrier has a right to their own path. And I've had situations before to where I've said, you know, if they've got this attorney who's very familiar with this insurance, we just move them to you. We were unaware. Uh, let's talk about how we can get them to, to our insurance to be able to use their attorney. And then they go to the attorney and the firm and you negotiate fees because at the, at the end of the day, it comes down to okay, well, if this firm is $750 an hour, but the panel that we have is $350 an hour. We need to come to an arrangement to where we're going to accept that. Because it, again, it's a duty to defend policy. The policy is meant to defend you and pay those fees. So the other variant on that potentially is, uh, for example, I have a client who has a significant SIR, self-insured retention of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So at the front end of the dispute, they can come directly and hire me because that's it's that counts money. against their SIR. It's their money, and then hopefully it gets resolved. You know, and that, that they're spending that on attorney's fees, experts, various different things. If it gets resolved before they hit that 250, it's fine. When they hit the 250, then the insurance company's gonna say, hey, now we're the, gonna be the ones who are paying for the, for the attorney. And then sometimes it's a negotiation as to whether or not I continue on right. at a reduced rate, or if my client will cover the delta between the pittance that insurance companies want to pay, and what an actual bit of, well, I'm sorry, what, you know, what <laughs> I would like to charge. Would this is like a deductible. Yes, that's, yeah, it's the so same thing. As a it is. The retention, though, is the insurance responsibility in front of the deductible, the carrier pays for the claim at the very beginning, and then sends you your settlement at the end minus your deductible. So another 
part of this process that was puzzling to me was was the insurer hiring the attorney to represent us. Uh, but there was another attorney who was working on behalf of the underwriter who was in constant contact with us. The bills got sent to us and copied to the insurance company paid through the insurance company. All the decisions seem to be my decisions, except that they are under this kind of cloud, right? This sort of dark cloud of we really think we should do this, but we're not going to tell you what to do. Uh, is that a typical scenario? I mean, who? who if, depending on who's hiring the attorney, who? who who does the attorney kind of, the attorney seems to have split loyalties. Yes, they do in that circumstance. Uh, so what the, what the ethical code for an attorney says is that if you are hired, it, it does not matter who pays your bill as to who you owe your duty to, right? So if I'm an attorney and I'm representing you, but Beth is paying my bills, I might have a primary obligation to you. I have some level of obligation to Beth as well, but I can't favor the insurance company over you, right? And and to the extent that the attorney sees that as a potential conflict, he or she needs to disclose that to both sides, and 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 either get out or have both sides kind of get their own counsel. Now, the other situation you said is sometimes the insurance company will hire a separate attorney. So there's the attorney they've hired to defend you. But it sounds like in that other instance, they hired a separate, what's called uh, coverage counsel, um, who, who is looking at whether or not the insurance company can deny coverage. So that coverage counsel, their responsibility is only to the insurance company. So in a lot of circumstances, whether it's in, in uh, construction or any other type of commercial situation, there's a number of times where my clients they have an attorney who's hired by the insurance company to defend them. They still hire me to keep an eye on that attorney and the insurance company because my only responsibility is to my client. Now, I don't go in and take the depositions. I don't handle the case. I'm not racking up a, hit, a huge bill. But when it gets to discussions of settlement, when it gets to discussions of coverage, then I'm there to help make sure that there is an attorney that is only interested you it only has a duty of loyalty to you. That answer the question. Yes. Okay. Uh, Marvin, do your owners have a, a compelling interest to be involved in this process to help? I mean, is there a role that that that, that they should play in trying to get these parties to come to the table? What does that look like? I think. Um, they, they sort of want to be one of the leaders in, in, in the communication, right? Bringing the parties together, bringing the information forward, uh, being the level head, you know, off of the of the, of the team, so that things do not get. Um, there, there are some owners who who are, are smart enough to say, "Hey, let's all come to the table and, and understand that there, there may be some responsibility." Some shared responsibility in the particular situation. When you start hearing that, you know you should smile because now you've got an owner that's willing to work through the issues, and in many cases, take some of the financial responsibility for that because maybe there was some direction that they gave. And this happens. This is, this it is does happen. Actually, happen. Uh, yeah, that's okay. all time. You know, I believe. Say, Mark, how many times have you heard third, third, third? Ooh, lots, lots of owner, lots. architect, contractor. You know, let's mm -hmm. not let's not let's get it done. Let's get it fixed. Third, third, third. Because ultimately, it, it, it this process does not help the project, especially if the project is not completed. You've got some some hard targets out there for substantial completion. And this that's not the time to be uh, sitting down with lawyers trying to you know, determine faults or you know liability. 
it's sitting down and understanding maybe where the disconnect may have been between the, the documents and the, the contract versus the field condition, which happens every day. So the, the owner, you know, as, as we advise them, they have a vested interest in resolving. Um, does anybody here have any, any questions? Uh, yeah, Michael, we have one from the uh, chat. Um, the question is, um, with all of the documentation and the checks that we have at the front end of a project, um, why do we end up with so many discrepancies uh, during the project, during construction, with uh, quantities being wrong, with costs being added, uh, with extra costs, and so forth? Many owners have this, this speed the market mentality. You know, you talk about uh, uh, getting into the ground before CDs are done, approved, permitted, right? You know, owners now are seeking a, for the CM to issue a GMP, right, at 60% SD or 50% DD. They want the GMP at that moment. You know that, Mike. I do. So, that in and of itself, you know, creates all the other problems that you mentioned after that, right? Whether it be, you know, there's so many things undefined at that at that point in the in the design. You know, they're bitten concrete without knowing that there was a this particular room needed a thick and slab because of a piece of equipment in there. But it wasn't designed at DD level. So we're almost asking, we're almost asking for it. Uh, owners are asking for it. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> what we, the owners, well, here's my experience with contractors. Contractors are optimistic people, right? I mean, you are. You It'll work out. It'll work right. out. Right. You know, right? So I think sometimes you see those issues, but you want to, you want the job, you want the work. You're going to kick the can down the road, and we'll be able to work it out when the time comes. And honestly, Nine out of ten. Many times, times it does. You can't work. work it out. When you can't, you call me and you spend a bunch of money that you thought you were going to save by trying to kick the can down the road. So you're absolutely right. But I, I think it might be more. Well, you put a bunch of contingency, you right. know, in the job to help to help cover that. Right. But then, as the owner, you need to be flexible enough when when that subcontractor comes back and says, you know, there was a there was a gap here. All right, I got a simple question. Yes, sir. For insurance. So, first of all, thank you for that phrase, duty to defend. I've not heard of that before, but it, it helps me to think about insurance companies better. Yeah. However, my question is because this goes back to experience when there is a claim made against me as the architect mm -hmm. um, through some fault of the job. And so we have to notify our insurance companies early. Right. Because that's what you're asking us to do. Mm -hmm. I think one of the fears. Mm -hmm reasons why that's not done is because then as that claim moves down through the process in this particular case will prove not to be negligible and no fault in it yet our insurance premiums go up for the next three years because of that claim which had nothing to do with us so why is that on the insurance side so i will start off by saying that there's a difference between the claim and putting your carrier on notice. So putting your carrier on notice, if you're aware of a claim, is just saying, hey, there's some circumstances, we're just gonna do our investigation on it and we'll let you know if it develops. You know, your professional liability is different than your general liability. So in a claim situation, and I'm assuming we're gonna go down the road of your professional liability, your errors and emissions coverage, that you were accused of making an error and it has caused a loss. There's now an occurrence. You put your carrier on notice, they're defending you. You still have that expense, but at the end of the day, it shows that we were found not negligent. What I do for my clients, we submit five years of loss rooms. That's what carriers and underwriters are going to demand. They're going to see five years of loss history. They want to see what you've been involved in. They want to see if you've been involved in the claim. And with that, if there has been a claim, then it is your producer or agent, whatever you want to call them, responsibility to provide a claim summary. 
So these carriers understand that you're going to be involved. It's just the nature of the business, especially in this litigious society that we're in. Sorry, Tom. But everybody oh, sues everybody. You rear end somebody, and now they've got a neck injury, and they see brown, brown on the billboard, they're going to call their a, an attorney. Carriers and underwriters are understanding that more often now that you're going to be brought into a suit. But as long as you keep that communication open, you're found not negligent, then it is your agent or your producer's responsibility to provide a claim summary to say, here are the facts of the case. We were involved, everything. There were over 100 other people, but we were found not negligent. And that shouldn't penalize you. I've had insurers before that have had E&O claims that put on notice, and they've had $100,000 worth of expenses because, again, the carrier had the duty to defend. Is it is it the claim, or is it in a hypothetical case, <laughs> there was a settlement for a relatively small amount of money that ended up on our loss roll? Loss rights. Correct. So if, in a, if a settlement has been... You paid that money back for our insurance. Right. What are the mountains? Right. If there was a settlement, again, it goes to that there should be a claim summary describing everything that happened. An underwriter will understand in a situation if there was a $100,000 loss and it's all expenses or there was a settlement made and $25,000 was just to get you out of that claim. Underwriters understand that in these days, it's, and Tom and I were talking earlier, write the check. The underwriter knows that depending oh, yeah. on what type of it is, how big it's going to be, if they can get out of it for $25,000, that underwriter or that carrier, that adjuster will cut the check just to get them out of it. So you being communication, having the producer communicate to your underwriters explaining the situation. Because otherwise, if they just get, here's applications, here's our loss runs, an underwriter looks at the very beginning and be like, no, no, I'm going to go with somebody that has zero losses over five years. Uh, if there's been a claim and there's been payment on that claim, provide a claim summary explaining the situation that happened. Could be good, could be bad. Provide an explanation as to what you've done to correct that so that it won't happen again. I negotiate with underwriters all day long. You would be shocked how much negotiating insurance companies can do and what you can get. If there's no claim, and this is, this is a dummy question, if there's no claim, it's just the notification that. You know, does, does all that go away once the issue is resolved? You know what I mean? It yeah. puts you on yeah. notice that potential, you know, it's potential, potential, but nothing, nothing comes out of that. Does all that, you know, you know, he doesn't have to be fearful of that because he notified you, put you on notice that somehow there's a blemish. Does that does that I go would, away? I would guess at some point it goes away after. I mean, you're gonna have. A record, it's going to be on your loss runs. They're going to see that there was a potential claim for five years. So, so that's so then, so there is still the potential that, that those premiums would go up for that five years. Not because of the claim, unless there's again, it's all about conversations with the underwriter explaining the situation. If they see a claim and they there's no explanation given as to what the circumstances were, the underwriter has the ability to say, go to their supervisor and say, here was the situation, here was the description of the claim, here's the correction that they made, we're not gonna deduct it from that. We're not gonna penalize them for that. Again, it's all about conversation and communication. Let me flip it around a different way. So I, I understand the question, I hear that from my clients all the time, which is, well, if I give notice of the claim, I'm taking the risk that my insurance is gonna go up. Okay, fine. If you don't give notice of the claim, taking the risk that you're going to not have, you're not going to be insured for that loss. And if they if they nail you, even if you're even if you think you did nothing wrong, we've all seen cases where you know the defendant didn't think they did anything wrong, and they get hit with a million dollar claim. So you want to take the risk that your insurance might go up a little bit for a number of years, or you want to take the risk that you're going to close the doors. On the firm, a million dollars. <laughs> because you can't pay a million dollars. You know, you know, there's business yeah. decisions that you make. Yep. But, but it, it comes it sounds like it comes down to it, it, I don't know what, what the rules are for setting premiums for professional liability coverage. And if there are rules, there are laws that deal with that. Like not my specialty. Okay. So I, I and it depends on you've got standard markets and you've got your 
ENS markets, which are specialty lines, standard markets have to follow guidelines, regulated regulations they have to, have to follow. You can get a policy from Lloyd's of London and it could insure anything and everything to pay, obviously. But uh, those uh, those types of policies, every policy can be different. But my professional liability is a standard policy. I don't know who your carrier is. It could be, it could not. Beasley, Beasley has admitted and they have not admitted. So admitted means that you're gonna they're gonna follow regulations, not admitted means they don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I'm not sure it's still true, but one time my underwriter for professional liability, the underwriter has said in writing that we will not let a simple notification of a possible problem affect your premiums. Um, because we want to know. Right. Uh, and it was in writing, it wasn't in my, my program, you can't negotiate anything. It was just, yeah, you can call us and say something is adding up, there may be a problem, we're going to figure it out. You're on notice. If that couldn't affect money, unless there was an actual plan, it couldn't affect money. I'm, I'm impressed you got it in writing. <laughs> no, That's I mean, great. those shares advertise it. Right. I mean, again, the communication that you have or the relationship that your broker has with your underwriters is key. And the, that communication means a lot. Communicating with your attorney right at the very beginning. Don't give us hypotheticals. Tell us immediately if something is happening. And we will guide you towards that path. And then talking to underwriters, first question they ask me, Beth, I got this submission. I've never seen this client before. Are they your client? Or are they moving from a different agency? They want to know the relationship you have with your insurance. They want to know that there's trust involved with your insurer, that they trust you, that they'll communicate with you if something arises. Are there any, uh, are there any questions on um, There's a comment from online. Um, the, the person who's making the comment uh, says that it's generally easier to resolve the smaller problems when you have an experienced owner, experienced architect, and experienced contractor, um, that usually the only difficulty in that type of project is the extremely large problems, um, but that the smaller, less experienced owners tend to um, squabble and, and fight a bit over uh, any sort of problem that comes up. So, I mean, my experience is consistent with yours that typically a sophisticated owner and a sophisticated contractor and designer are going to work out 95 out of 100 problems that they have um, because they, they want a solution. They don't want to fight. Now, unfortunately, you know, that it doesn't always work out. I, I, I don't know if I want to tell a war story, but yeah, you guys are here. But, uh, you know, I had a, a, an arbitration, week-long arbitration that I did down in Dallas about um, seven or eight years ago. And sophisticated owner, uh, real estate developer, sophisticated uh, design builder. And uh, after completion, it was, it was a little bit of an odd project. It was a three-story tilt-up office building, uh, which I don't see a whole lot of tilt-up office building. But... After completion of construction, the owner came back and they had hired a large forensic engineering firm. They came back and said, hey, there's 256 connections in this building and all of them are under design. Um, and they spent over a million dollars going in and, and shoring up that design. We had done what I recommended is we hired an independent investigator. An engineer came in and said eight. Of those 256 connections, eight were under design and we said it'll cost eighty-two thousand dollars to fix those eight. We're offering you eighty-two. They said no, we spent one point three million dollars fixing it. And so we went to the arbitration. And after a week long arbitration, the arbitrators awarded the owner eighty-two thousand dollars and awarded us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in attorney's fees. Okay, so that was a situation where Sophisticated parties, I mean, they should have just figured it out, right? And, and, and my client wanted to resolve it. So here's your problem, let's fix it. And they said, no, we're going to arbitration. We paid three arbitrators for a week to sit there 
and come to a decision that we had offered to do nine months earlier. So unfortunately, sophisticated parties are not a guarantee that you're going to get rational actions. Any other questions? Or, oh, back. Yeah, please. one last thing on what, what Tom said about uh, sophistication, and, and sometimes that's not enough. And I think some of what I've seen, you know, a uh, a bad or foolish ego sometimes can 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 really go to to null and void that sophistication and and knowing what what the right avenue is to resolve something. Um, sort of like you know, I like to do lessons learned with my own clients at the end of the project. What what went well, what did not go well. And sometimes people don't want to do the lessons learned because sometimes lessons learned will uncover right uh, some things and people people have bruised they, their egos get bruised very easily and and I think sometimes even what I've seen with things that could have been resolved that should have been resolved that ended up in a claim because someone their title their position you know had them feeling like they could not compromise Um, one of the things that we talked about, I guess, in the first of the five uh, seminars that we did was the uh, collapse of the lift slab building in the 1980s in Connecticut, which essentially was one of the first ones that was solved with this sort of a massive uh, federal panel, everybody chipped in. And they ended up hitting, you know, uh, the, the dry, drywall contract who, who wasn't even on the, the site. It pretty much got a little bit of money from those guys and more money from the people who were probably more directly at fault, but they were able to get it solved in a matter of like, I'm going to say maybe eight months, compensate the 80-some victims who, who died. And um, I, I've always thought that that was a great model for the horrible things that, that happened, because even though a lot of people probably paid into it that shouldn't have everybody, every company survived, right? Nobody went bankrupt. And to your point, I think that too often people make it about winning rather than about sur surviving. Yeah. I have a question about the name of it, but you know, there's this trend to bring in contractors during design. And the owners to bring in the team in, expertise to design it, and I'll be able to take it together. And can you speak to that at all? I'll talk a little bit without yeah. talking about the insurance. I mean, that, that, that's what you're saying. I can't talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, what, what, you're, what you're referring to is generally either the IPD, which is Integrated yes. Project yes. Delivery, yes. Um, or uh, under, a, under a design build or CM. Um, at risk scenario, the major uh, trades are brought in under a design assist uh, uh, scenario where they are working in concert with the engineer of record uh, right. for the for those uh, disciplines. So they're working during the design process with the design team. And are you seeing less claims or issues and change orders in that process? Uh, is that you know, I, I wish I could tell you that I'm seeing less change orders. I think the the uh, the sell usually the sell when the when the CM or design builder is is wanting the owner to engage in a particular delivery method, they say, "Well, there's no change orders." I haven't seen that 37 years. Okay. You know, but but that's the that's the sell. Well, you know, we're, we are controlling the design. Under the design build scenario, so theoretically there would be no change orders. You know, so um, claims. I, I I don't see a ton of claims, and I, I think you know time's going to see more than I'm probably want going to see. I, I, I see more things get resolved and worked out. Everybody may not be happy at the end, but there's no there's no legal. Um, you know, th does it matter? Does it matter if, as designers? Does it matter if we hire our product reps, our product representatives? Like some of our product representatives, we are relying on for for recommendations of specific product for a specific application to perform 
to a, you know to a certain level. But I'm not door hardware. Yes, uh, I'm thinking of, of coatings, but uh, but I'm not hiring. I don't have a contract. And at the end of the day, I'm selecting the product based on their recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in that particular product. I don't, I don't manufacture those products. I don't test them. I can look at numbers, but I'm relying on a product representative with some expertise to give me that advice. Does it matter whether I, whether I hire them or not? Does that put me in a better position? I know some firms in town, some of the bigger firms especially, are leaning on the idea that they are paying certain reps uh, a token amount because they want them in the in the kind of line of fire when a design liability issue comes up. Well, I, I think it helps during the design and and hopefully um, submittals and that whole that whole process where you have to be careful whether you hire that product person or not is doing the application of that, whether it's flooring, you know, and, and there's a certain manufacturer's recommendation for for preparing substrate and then, you know, whether there's a certain adhesive or that, that product expert, unless he's there on site seeing that if, if something failed because the the flooring contractor manipulated the manufacturer's installation, you know, the the end result is the same in terms of who they're going to start looking at. Well, and, and Michael, that, that product rep isn't carrying any kind of liability right. insurance. Right. No, I, I'm not. I think you're just asking. But why. here's the other thing, is, and I know this is, I know this is, a, I know this is a very lawyerly response. Not that, yeah. But it kind of comes with the territory. Uh, it, a lot of it depends. So if you hire them. And the contract that you have with them has a limitation of liability, you know, of ten thousand dollars or something like that. Then you actually may put yourself in a worse position. Ooh, you said the magic words. Then by this hiring, is, this is what I, I well, maybe the last words. Okay, yeah. word, right. <laughs> right. So it depends. It just saying hiring them. I don't know. So it depends on what the deal is. So. And right. Once once we we've, we've gone through this process, we have a claim. We are we are now in dispute resolution mode. Our contracts kick in. We are in mediation. Okay. Uh, another attorney gets involved to, to be the mediator. Maybe it's the attorney or not, but some another third party is now engaged according to the terms of the, of the agreements to be the mediator to resolve this dispute. We can't resolve it. Because it's mediation, nobody's bound to anything. And you know, we we say, well, we're we're not liable to screw up, and the owner says, well, you are liable because it doesn't work, and it's a very short mediation. Okay, been there, had those. Now, now it's a loss, right? Um, I always have a limitation of liability in my agreement. I was shocked. Shocked to find out that that was not the end of the conversation when it came to offers of settlement. Uh, and that the, now that we're in a lawsuit mode, there is a judge involved over this, this process, this pre trial process, uh, who said, I see your limitation of liability, and we are going to ignore it. Right? And you guys are going to continue to do. So, what's the point? <laughs> um, I would say that as a general proposition, limitations on liability contained in contracts between sophisticated parties are generally enforceable. I will also say that the first construction arbitration that I ever did uh, was against the Geotech. And the Geotech had a limitation of liability provision in its agreement. Which we blew right through and got a much larger award than their limitation of liability. So there are legal arguments to get around that. And so what a judge is typically saying is, okay, I hear you, Michael, you say my liability is limited, limited to fifty thousand dollars, but this person over here is saying that for these factors under the law, that's not applicable. 
I got to hear all the evidence to decide first. So we're going to go forward with the lawsuit. Now, I will tell you, I just want to throw out one plug. Most of your contracts have arbitration provisions. I will tell you one of the main differences between arbitration and litigation in the court is it is really hard to get arbitrators to kick things out early. Right? Well, let's you know, if it's if it is, seems pretty clear that something is not a valid claim, it is harder to get arbitrators to kick it out than it is to get a judge to kick it out. Right? And, and I think, from my perspective, it's simple economics. Okay? You pay your arbitrators. And, our, and I'm not saying that any of them are doing this consciously, that they're being bad people, but their income stream is greater if this goes all the way to the end to an actual hearing and a decision. Okay? Judges get paid whether they have any cases or not. So every case they dismiss lessens their work. And so think long and hard. There's a lot of people love arbitration, but there are some downsides. The only advice I've ever been given is mediation and litigation. Yeah, I think that we went hard on arbitration for a long time, but then people are realizing that its promises of cost saving are largely illusory. Okay, unless you do, I have another client who in their in their contracts with their subcontractors. They have what's called a rocket docket arbitration. Okay, you can set up an arbitration. Most arbitration, you just go AAA construction rules arbitration. It's litigation with three judges instead of one and without the right of appeal, basically. But they have in their contract with their subcontractors basically saying, if we have, if we have something that's called arbitration, it's going to go to arbitration within 30 days. Each side is just going to submit in writing their evidence. There's going to be one arbitrator, and that arbitrator is going to make a decision in 30 days. And you can write that in your contract, and if everybody agrees to it, that's the way you're, it's going to be decided, and that is a cost saving. Well, <laughs> unless there are any other pressing questions. With that, I want to thank Tom, Beth, and Marvin. I greatly appreciate your, your backup here. And uh, uh, thanks everybody for attending here and online. And this is our last program of the season. So we will see you, uh, members again, we'll see you at a couple of events uh, between now and next fall. But otherwise, uh, we hope you'll consider joining if you aren't a member and consider taking some exams, getting some certifications. Thank you. Thank you.